Cool. Welcome to episode 80 of the Twig Snapper podcast. I'm very happy to have Mike Zook, former NHLer, Michigan Tech Husky, join me today. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great, Alex. Thank you. And yeah, nice to join you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, I figured we could start out by talking about your time at Tech. Um, had a teammate of yours on a while back, Bruce Who was Horsch. That? Oh, Horshey, yeah. Yeah. yeah good guy. And uh, we were talking about the national championship that yeah. you guys won and how different it was back then compared to the way it is now and the way that college hockey is now. Yeah, WCHA was the strongest by far, I'd say. I wouldn't say by far, but we were definitely the strongest uh, association. Uh, the four years that I was at Tech, uh, I don't know if people remember, but we went to the final three years in a row against Minnesota. And then years before and even years after uh, my tenure at Tech, WCHA dominated the national scene. And then eventually as more teams, more and more schools got uh, got into t- uh, Division One hockey and more and more players uh, developed at that level, then it kind of spread out to the East Coast and then, you know, the CCHA and and all the other divisions got stronger and stronger as uh, more and more players uh, were able to play at a high level. Yeah, it just kind of developed and grew over the years. Um, yeah. When you were at Tech, you were also very lucky to be coached by Coach John McGinnis, one of the all-time greats in the world of hockey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was uh, – well, first of all, it helped that he was there to recruit and then when we, we were there, he recruited well. Then, obviously, he did he did a lot with the talent he had. So, yeah, we were. I was very lucky to be there with John for four years. Yeah. And when I had Bruce on, he mentioned that John cared a lot about academics as well as athletics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He you, you couldn't uh, you could not keep your your studies up and, and keep playing. So that he he harped on it. He made sure that we knew. It was very important to him. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's important for for all coaches to value academics because that's the main point of going to college. I mean, yeah, guys want to get to the NHL, but. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and, and it's really, I mean, what's the, what's the percentage now that make it to the NHL? I know when I played, it was very small percentage because the NHL, a lot of the teams didn't recognize the talent, you know, and uh, so if you're not going to make a living playing hockey, you better get a good education to, to help you make a living. Uh, elsewhere. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, you also are the all time leading point guy at Michigan Tech, 310 points in 163 games. And when I had Bruce on, he mentioned that when you guys were playing, you were never nobody was nervous if you guys were down two or three goals because he said because there were guys like Mike Zook and others that could just score so we always had faith that we could we could come back because we had guys that could put the puck in the net. <laughs> um, did you hear my? my uh, you said you meant something about what Horshey said, um, and that yeah, was he the- he said that. Um, Nobody was ever worried when you guys were down two or three goals because there were guys like Mike Zook and a few other guys on the team that could just put the puck in the net. So there was never really a concern to be down a couple of goals. I don't remember ever being down a couple of goals. <laughs> 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 no, I'm being facetious. We, uh, we had some really good teams. Uh, as you know, we went to the final th- three years in a row. And uh, uh, I guess – we just we had a lot of confidence. We knew we had talent. Uh, we could score. Uh, we could score a lot. John. The one thing about John, he always preached defense too. That's one of the reasons that uh, one of the things that really helped me when I got to the pros that I wasn't just an offensive player. There were other teams that played just run and gun, and it, it didn't help your all round game. But uh, we had a lot of talent. We had usually had three really good scoring lines and a really good checking line, defensive line, uh, penalty kill unit. So we were, we had a lot of good talent. That's what, well, that's, that's why we got to the NCAA final three years in a row as well as Minnesota. But uh, we, we played with a lot of confidence and John, somebody told me at one point, John was a very defensive coach. 
until he started to get the talent that we had. And then he kind of, he never said it to us, but somebody had told me that he, he decided, you know what, let's not get in the way of these guys playing offense. Even though yeah. he preached defense and we, and we we played well defensively, he never uh, held us back. So uh, right. I think that's why we, I think we probably scored quite a few goals, uh, and we had the ability to to come back when we were down a few. Yeah. Do you recall if there was a some sort of a streak where you guys had consecutive home wins in a row or something? I don't know if we ever talked about it, ever thought about it. I know what you're talking about now because I've seen the records yeah. every once in a while. I go, oh, did we do that? <laughs> yeah. But I don't remember. It was so long ago. I don't remember if we were conscious about it. I, I know we weren't trying to set records. I, I don't think yeah. we ever said, hey, we got to win this one because we're at X and we got to got to keep the streak going. But, uh, you know, at, at points we knew we were doing well but I don't think we were conscious about it at the time. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Let's kind of move into the NHL now a little bit. Uh, Was there a certain guy or or player or coach or anyone that that really helped you when you transitioned from college into the NHL kind of early in your career? Well, if you want, I can start with kind of a history because it kind of talks about college hockey and college hockey players. Sure. My first year pro, well, I was drafted by Indianapolis and uh, St. Louis Blues. And at the time, St. Louis in the NHL, they were going through a, a tough period with ownership. And there wasn't a lot of money. And uh, they had drafted, the year I turned pro, they had drafted a, a centerman out of the Western Canada Hockey League, Bernie Federko, who was very talented, very offensive player. And... Uh, the Blues really didn't want to sign me at the time. Uh, and back then, a lot of the teams, like I said earlier, I think, they didn't really have confidence in college players. They didn't understand how good we were. You know, they equated college hockey as not as defensive, not as physical, uh, and uh, not that many games to make you ready for, for college hockey, for, for pro hockey. Uh, they were wrong, but they didn't understand it. And yeah. uh, really what happened, and uh, I can kind of uh, give kudos to the 80 Olympic team, because once the 80 Olympic team won the, uh, the gold medal, then all of a sudden the colleges realized, well, you know, some of these kids can play. <laughs> you know, you, you had five or six of them come out right away and do really well. And then from there they started recognizing, but, Getting back to St. Louis, they couldn't they couldn't afford me. Not that I was made I wanted a whole lot of money, but they didn't want to sign me. So I went to the world hockey. I was I was owned by Indianapolis, and their first co their coach when I was there really didn't understand college hockey. I remember he sent me down. I had a good training camp. He sent me to the minors because, like I said, I didn't play enough games. It wasn't defensive hockey. Uh, I needed to learn how to play defense, you know, defensive hockey. And he didn't have a confidence that I could turn my offensive skills into the offensive skills at the pro level. Well, he he was wrong, but he didn't know it at the time. So (laughs) I I played in Indianapolis for one year. I actually got sent to the minors, played, basically played uh, in the league that uh, the movie Slapshot was based on for for six months or half the year let's say four months and then i got brought up to indianapolis played 30 games or so uh one guy that helped me that who was in the minors at the time when i was down in the minors was brian brian conacher he recognized my skills because he saw me playing all the time he ended up coming up to indianapolis when i came up and uh was there and then luckily for me he ended up as assistant or general manager in Edmonton. So in the off season, he traded to get me from Indianapolis up to Edmonton with the Oilers when they were in the world hockey still. So I was up with him as he was a general manager and uh, Glenn Sather was a coach up there. And uh, I, I had a good training camp. I played decent enough to make the team. And then he kept playing me. And eventually by the end of the year, 
he recognized that I had a lot of talent. So he started playing me and pointing the power play on the power play, uh, regular shifts, penalty killing. So I got a lot of exposure, uh, ended up leading the team in scoring the last half of the year. So he, he helped me a lot. And then uh, I was a free agent, basically, because uh, my contract was up and I could either stay and sign with Edmonton or uh, jump to the NHL. And at that time, because I had a good, good season, now the Blues were interested. So I could have signed for either, uh, either team, the Oilers or, uh, or St. Louis, but I decided, well, Let's go to the NHL and see how see what happens there. So, I went to I came to the NHL and uh, got hurt in training camp. Got sent to the minors. But when I came up uh, around Christmas time, Barkley Plager was a coach, and he recognized my skills offensively, but he also recognized my defensive skills. Funny, the year before I couldn't play defensively, and all of a sudden now I was a star defensive player or two way player. So not a star, but a, a good player. So he, he, I remember him in training camp putting his arm around me and saying, Mike, you're, you're my, you're my guy who can play both ends of the ice. I'm going to play you against all the top players that we play against. So every time we played Buffalo, I was against the French connection line and Gilbert Perot. Every time we played against, uh, LA, I played against Marcel Dion and, uh, his two wingers that were a real good team against Montreal. I played against the Lafle- Fleur, Shut, and Lemaire. So I was tested and uh, I think I did a pretty good job and he was happy with me. So he showed a lot of confidence in me and that helped me to uh, play with a lot of confidence. And I, I also played uh, point to power play because they knew I could do it. And I played a regular shift. So I played a lot and uh, I'd say, uh, Glenn Sather in the, in Edmonton in the world hockey helped me establish myself. And then Barkley player Plager showed a lot of confidence to me and played me a lot and, uh, helped. Well, I got a lot of points because I was, I was playing a lot and, uh, playing, uh, you know, offensive and, and power play and penalty kill. So I, they helped me establish my career in, in the NHL or in pro hockey. So the initial hang up was all that just, being a college hockey player and and the leagues and and the coaches not having faith in them and that's kind right. of what you know held guys back was just that label you know you came out it didn't matter if you had success at the college level they didn't seem to care about that yeah right exactly and at that time the NHL was pretty tough you know the Broad Street Bullies uh, the Bad News Bears or, or uh, Bruins whatever were winning and they were. There was a lot of fighting, bench clearing brawls, line line brawls. So when when the college hockey didn't have fighting, they saw that as a negative. That well, you weren't tough enough too. That was part of it. You know, it was never said to me that I wasn't tough enough. But I think that that initial coach sending me to the minors thought that I I either didn't I wasn't a fighter. I didn't want to be a fighter. I didn't know how to fight. You know, you got to learn how to do it. If not, yeah. what I tell people now is I played 10 years pro. If I tried to fight, I'd probably play 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I knew where my, my bread was buttered. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing I, I wanted to mention, you know, based on that kind of era of hockey, you talked about the bench clearing brawls and the hard game, was the fact that a lot of guys still didn't wear helmets. You know, there were a lot yeah. of guys that, that didn't. Yeah, I would say when I started, it, it was probably, let's say, 30% of the guys wore helmets, 70% didn't. Did you? Oh, yeah, I wore, yeah, I wore, well, I got, I had a couple of concussions at Tech uh, wearing a helmet, and when I got to the pros, I'm saying, I'm not going to take this off, and uh, I ended up having a couple of cu- concussions with a helmet, so I, I thought, I knew it was crazy not to wear one, so... You know, I wore I wore one and I wore mine in, in warm ups because the guy the way the guys were shooting pucks, I didn't want to get hit in the head with a puck either. So Yeah. Yeah. Did you see any, you know, nasty injuries ever with guys that didn't have a helmet on? I did not see one, uh, but one of my teammates who I played with for four years in St. Louis actually got sent down to the minors 
my last year in St. Louis. So I was in St. Louis. He was in Salt Lake City. And unfortunately, he got uh, he, he got, took a real, real hard body check. It was clean, but he got hit um, behind the net, fell backwards, hit his head on the boards, and then hit his head on the ice. And then he he was actually lucky to live because they had to do uh, surgery, relieve the pressure on his brain from the blood, and he was never the same. He his name was Eddie Kia, and he he turned into a you know he he ended up being somebody that was very very uh, badly stricken with a head injury, and uh, he ended up not not being able to hold a job after that. Never played again. And unfortunately, passed away a few years later because he went into a epileptic fit and fell into the fell off a, his dock up in Canada, and and ended up drowning because of his head injury. So, but I never did see any real bad ones. But I heard that one, and you know, always heard about the uh, Masterson uh, injury where he fell backwards, hit his head. That was that was before I got to uh, got to the NHL. And I'm sure a lot of those were the reason that, you know, things changed and rules changed and everyone started to have to wear helmets. And Yeah, my last couple of years pro, I think it was probably early 80s, they instituted a, a rule that if you were a new player in the NHL, you had to wear a helmet. And guys that were already in the NHL that didn't, you could sign a waiver. and they, So they grandfathered the fact in that you didn't have to wear a helmet. But all the new guys coming into the league had to wear one. Yeah. And now they've graduated to a point where all the new guys in the NHL have to wear visors. Yeah. And they've they've had guys sign waivers that if you didn't wear a visor when the rule was put into effect, you don't have to, but you sign a waiver. But if you're a brand new player coming in, you have to wear a visor. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense, you know. Oh yeah, with, absolutely. With, the, with injuries and stuff like that, and and your, I mean, your example is a perfect example. Some of these injuries can be life-ending injuries. Oh yeah, and then the game's gotten so much faster. The puck is flying harder. I mean, the guys are skating faster. You know, they're bigger and stronger. So that uh, I couldn't imagine anybody not playing uh, with a helmet at this yeah. at this level of hockey. Yeah. Um, I'll just throw this out there because I forgot to mention it. Just background for people who who don't know, but um, you played in over 400 NHL games, and and you had, um, I guess I didn't look at the playoff points, but you had 282 regular season points, um, and then some more in the playoffs. So that's what I kind of want to go into here is the playoffs. Yeah. Um, you you went to the playoffs multiple years with the Blues. I think it was a four years in a row. You guys were in the playoffs. It could have been uh, three or three at the minimum, maybe four. Uh, like I said, the the Blues had financial uh, issues and weren't doing well um, before I got there. The year I got there, uh, maybe the next year also, we didn't make the playoffs uh, because we had a young team they were rebuilding and then the last well one year we almost we came second in the whole league and uh we started i think in 80 maybe it was 79 we made the playoffs and then from that from then on i like 25 years in a row the blues made the playoffs but then when i went to hartford after after five years in st louis uh i went to hartford and uh, we had a pretty good team but we were in a division it was an unbalanced schedule so we had to play against Boston Bruins, Montreal Canadiens, Buffalo Sabres, uh, who else? Uh, Quebec Nordiques at the time. And those four teams were probably in the top 10 in the league. And to make the playoffs, you had to win your, you had to be one of the top four teams in your division. So we were always last place in our division. And as hard, uh, you know, as the Whalers, but we did well against everybody else. But as with an unbalanced schedule, we couldn't make the playoffs. So the three years I was in Hartford, we didn't make the playoffs. Yeah, I wanted to bring up. You talked about you know having a good team. Um, one of the guys you played with, so you had the connection with Bruce Horsch, and obviously yeah. he was on the initial miracle roster, got cut through the process. Right. Yeah. Um, but then in Hartford, you played with Mark Johnson. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the best 
American hockey players and just a fantastic coach too. Um, yeah. The success he had after. Yeah. Mag- Magic, uh, as you know, what he, he was very instrumental in them winning the gold medal and then uh, had a good, good pro career. Yeah. He was the center uh, and uh, Ron Francis was there at the time. Yep. He was a really good player. Ulf Samuelson. Uh, oh, um, Dave Tippett. Uh, yep. Let's see who else was there that, that had a name. Uh, Kevin Deneen. Uh, they were all good players, ended up being very good players down the road. But they, Ron Francis was young. Um, all those guys I mentioned were young and, and rookies when they came in. So Hartford was building too. And I don't know if it was coincidence or not, but the year I left Hartford, they ended up, I think, winning the, winning the championship, winning the uh, division and made the playoffs. So I don't know if it was because I left or the, the young guys figured out how to play. So. Well, I, I'm sure it's not because because you left. And it's got to be the other one that. Yeah, I hope left. so. That's, that's my story anyway. <laughs> yeah, in um, 82, 83, you played 13 games in the CHL. Yeah, uh, I had a real good season starting out, and uh, they ended up. Uh, and I should mention Red Berenson, Barkley Plager, I mentioned helped me out. Red Berenson helped me out too because when Barkley Plager got sick in, uh, I think, 79-80 or somewhere around there. Uh, yeah, 79-80, uh, Barkley got sick. Red Berenson took over, and he was a college um, player. And then uh, as a coach, he, 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 uh, he was the one who helped us uh, get to second place in the whole league. Um, so we did well, and in the next year, uh, some of the guys came back a little fat and happy, and uh, and a couple injuries hurt us, and we didn't weren't doing so well, and that, so they uh, uh, Emil Francis took over as head coach, and he was an old army guy, so he ran us like an army, and uh, I had a hard time playing for him. So uh, the next year in training camp, even though I had a decent first half when. Uh, Red was there. My second half wasn't so good, so he ended up sending me to Salt Lake City, and I played there for whatever number of games you said. Came up to the Blues in the end of the year, played in the playoffs, and then the following year, uh, Emil Francis uh, went to Hartford as general manager, and even though he sent me down to the minors uh, the year before, he brought me to Hartford and I played three years for him, and I, I played a lot for them. So it, it's kind of weird how, how things ended up. But he, he recognized my defensive capabilities. And when I, got to, when I got to Hartford, I ended up being mostly a defensive player. Uh, once again, covering the, 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 uh, the league's top players. By then it was Gretzky, Lemieux, and Stastny. And uh, so I was on the, basically the fourth line uh, playing defensive hockey, killing penalties. But I still played the point of power play because I was still the offensive skills. So, kind of a weird, weird career, I guess. But it was <laughs> yeah. it, it worked out. Yeah, and I noticed that you know initially in your career you had scoring success, and then like you said, you turned into a more of a defensive player. And um, it's kind of funny how you said that he sent you down, and then the, the year later he brought you to Hartford. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, they well, he went to Hartford, and they. I guess in training camp, they were awful in, in penalty killing. And then uh, there was new ownership in St. Louis. So they they had, they had didn't have a problem letting me go. And uh, Emil Francis recognized my defensive uh, abilities. So he brought me in to, to help. So, you know, he recognized my, what I could, uh, what I could offer the team. So it, it was good to go to Hartford and play another three years for them. You mentioned, you know, at this point how you were playing against Gretzky and different guys. Was there ever a sense of, you know, intimidation, you know, in your sense? You were towards the end of your career. Gretzky was coming in, this hot shot, you know, just putting up crazy numbers. And, and you know, when you played those guys, was there ever a sense of... No, know, I had... By then, I had, a, I had confidence in my abilities. You know, defensively, mm-hmm. I was doing, uh, doing well... Uh, for the Whalers uh, on that end, we weren't doing great as a team, but I, I felt confident in what I was doing. Uh, I had confidence going against those guys. Well, first of all, Lemieux wasn't the player he was. 
he, when he came into the league, uh, the story on him was hit him, hack him, whack him, and he'll get off his game. And it really was it was that kind of the first three years he was there. And people tell the story, and I agree. Until he learned how to play, he played in the Canada Cup against with Gretzky. And until he learned how to fight through it and learned how to be the superstar he ended up being, um, he didn't. You didn't really worry too much about his his scoring, or I didn't. Although he, <laughs> although when he first got in the league, he still scored 100 points, but he wasn't the superstar that he turned into. Yeah. And Gretzky, I had confidence in 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 covering him. But uh, he somehow he always turned into he always found ways to to uh, to take advantage of of teams and uh, I can tell a little story if you want um, yeah I I was in Hartford my my job was to to watch Gretzky we were up in Edmonton and my coach in the locker room said all right anytime Gretzky's on if you're on the ice you get off I want Zukon. And uh, whenever there was a stoppage in play, Gretzky was on, he put me on. Well, first period, I'm playing against him, doing a good job. Uh, I'm on the bench. Gretzky jumps out. We didn't have a chance to make a, a line change. Gretzky scored a goal with me on the bench. All right, he got one. Uh, second period, uh, I'm killing penalties. Gretzky's on the ice in the power play. I'm, at, I'm in the, on the point. You know, I'm watching the point in our own zone. Gretzky's in the corner in our zone, shoots the puck out to the front of the net, hits our defenseman, puck goes in the net. So he's got two goals. I couldn't stop either one of them. So, and like I said, I played point in the power play. Well, we were down, I think, 3-2 or 2-1 at the end of the game. We pull our goalie. I'm on the point in their zone. Gretzky gets the puck behind the net in his zone, throws it down the ice into the empty net. He gets a hat trick, and my job is to stop Gretzky from scoring. <laughs> so he was opportunistic in that respect. I mean, nothing against him, but when it was five on five and I was able to play him even up, I thought he did a good job. Yeah. But he scored three <laughs> goals against me. So the coach is probably looking at the score sheet the next day. What the heck was Zook doing? You know, Gretzky gets a hat trick. <laughs> Even though he was in different positions, you weren't on the ice. There were a yeah. lot of fans. <laughs> yeah, he scores from the from the corner, uh, hitting one of our defensemen in the in the shin pads and going in. But that's the way he, you know, he was opportunistic and taking nothing away from him. He was a great player. Yeah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the way it went. So, how did you decide that it was time to retire? Well. I had a contract where um, the year that the third year I came to Hart, I went to Hartford. Uh, they wanted to put me on a two-way contract because they had a lot of young kids coming up. They still knew I was valuable to the team, but they had a few kids that they didn't know if they could move in and, and take my spot. So I negotiated a deal where, look, you're going to keep me up. I'm not going to take the whole summer off and uh, get sent to the minors in training camp. So I had my lawyer, uh, my agent uh, work a deal where, all right, I'll be up. I'll be in uh, Hartford for the first half of the year, make you know decent money. And then at Christmas or around Christmas time, Hartford could decide whether or not they wanted me to go to the minors or, um, I could decide what I wanted to do. So at Christmas, they decided, you know, we're going to let these young kids develop. Mike, why don't you go to the minors? And they act- actually offered me an assistant coach uh, player position in, in the, I think it was Binghamton. At that point, I, I, I had a couple of years in the minors, riding the buses coming up. I, was, I wasn't confident in my game. I certainly didn't want to ride the bus anymore and play in the minors. So I just decided, you know, time to, time to hang them up. So I just said, look, I'm, I'm going to go back to St. Louis. I knew St. Louis was going to be home. So I, I, I told Emil Francis that no, I'll, I'll just retire and, and go back to St. Louis. So he was fine with that. And I called it quiz. Yeah. And then when did you start your business? Well, I've worked for, um, I worked for a couple of companies. I worked for, uh, as a, 
as a, a manager in one company, uh, a construction company, uh, just my, managing the office a little bit. And then I got into, uh, I went, I changed jobs, went into medical, uh, not medical sales, but it was a medical sales company. And I got into promotions, uh, running a promotional program for them. And then as my kids were coming up, and uh, because I started in, in business, the business world at 35, I figured I'd be a vice president when I was 75. <laughs> so I started this company on the side while I was working, uh, uh, buying, uh, buying uh, hockey stuff wholesale and selling it to a couple of friends that were, were running ranks. And... Uh, Eventually, the business started growing. They wanted jerseys. They wanted equipment. And, and, and then they, I started selling uh, T-shirts and, and golf shirts and that. So I was, I was working probably 30 hours uh, away from my main job, selling uh, you know, my own, running my own business. And I decided when my kids were playing hockey, I wanted to maybe try and run my own business be my own boss so I could take time off to coach. So I ended up uh, quitting the uh, medical job and devoting full time to my, my own business. And that was, shoot, that was probably 1995 and I'm still doing it. And you must enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy it. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, interesting. It's every, every day is different. And I've, I've grown the business, uh, I ended up the last uh, last year. I'm now a preferred provider to the NHL alumni for everything I sell. So I sell a lot of hockey jerseys, apparel, uh, promotional products, uh, uh, Sony, let's say uh, Bluetooth speakers, stuff like that. So yeah. there's a lot of opportunities in it, and uh, a lot of uh, because I've been in it so long, I know where to get the best best prices, and I I've got connections with a lot of good companies. I I now sell Nike and Travis Matthew and Peter Millar shirts and, and yeah. CCM Bauer uh, apparel. And then on top of the, like I said, Sony, uh, Sony uh, speakers and Bose speakers and whatnot. So it's, it's been a good business and yeah. it's uh, helped me support the family. And I've, I've actually I've run, run the business out of my home all these years. So it's, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, it's been fun and I enjoy it and it's, it's helped me, uh, support my family yeah um one two two things here um, kind of wrapping up and one of them is you know what are your thoughts on the modern game i asked uh my guest that i recorded with last night um he played in the nhl in the mid to late 2000s and i think he was done in the nhl by 2013 so right. different than now but then yeah. obviously you played even before that which was different from that yeah. Um, so, you know, he talked about the differences in, you know, it's less hard now and it's faster and all these things, which is, you know, kind of what you said, but it was harder when you played um, yeah. harder hockey. So do you like the modern game? Do you like the way the NHL is going? It's uh, I like the skill level. I mean, it's amazing what these guys can do. You watch uh, Matthews and, Connor McDavid is unreal. The way he skates, the way he handles the puck, the way he sees the ice. Uh, you know, we had Gretzky and Lemieux. They were darn good players, but uh, these guys take it to a new level and, and the skill level of everybody. Back when I played, there were he maybe had two lines of good skill players, a third line of uh, of good solid players, and then one line of either goons or or defensive players that weren't real skilled. Now. If you're not skilled, you can't even play a fourth line uh, position, and uh, it's. I think it's it's better coached, much better coached. Uh, we had guys. Some of the, you know, the guys I mentioned were really good coaches. Red Berenson was a good coach. Uh, Glenn Sather was uh, real good. You know, you know the success he had with the Oilers, uh, but a lot of the coaches didn't know much about about coaching or the game or how it should be played. It was dump it in, dump it out, you know, guy hits you, you fight him. Uh, <laughs> now that every coach, they have the video coaches, uh, they understand the game, they understand players, they understand how to handle players differently. So it's it's a real, it's a good game. It's entertaining. 
uh, a lot of it's um, not dump it in, but a lot of what they do now is gain the offensive zone as quick as they can and then work the puck around and work it on the outside and try and control it to get your scoring chances. Uh, back when I played, there was there were more scoring chances because a lot of guys didn't know how to play a defensive game. There were guys that were just truly offensive and, and weren't worried about playing in their own zone. Now you have to play both ends of the ice. So it's, it's a lot harder to, to score because of that, because everybody plays well defensively, but then it's offset by the offensive players. They're so skilled. And then the, the goalies are so good now. I mean, it's amazing. You see these goalies, what they do, how they move from side to side. Uh, their athleticism is tremendous. So it's, I just say it's, it's a, it's an entertaining game. I think ours was entertaining. But now, you know, watch, I mean, the Michigan move. I mean, whoever thought of that? Uh, actually, if you would have tried the Michigan move when I played, you would have been sent to the minors because you would have been a, you would have been a showboater, you know, so. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, the games are both entertaining, but in just different ways. Yeah, exactly. And people try, you know, how do you compare a Gretzky to a, a Connor McDavid? Well, you really can't, you know, mm -hmm. two different uh, – Time periods, two different skill sets, different game. Uh, they were both uh, tremendous players. Yeah, people try to do that across all sports. You know, they put out every once in a while the NFL 100 team or something, and yeah. they're trying to compare offensive linemen from the 40s to ones now. Well, offensive yeah. linemen in the 40s were 180 pounds, or you know, they, they and they had one little bar in front of their face. Yeah, you know? and the same thing with hockey. You know, there were some obviously guys who are great in the history books from the early days of of pro hockey, and you can't yeah. compare them to no, no. No, they were, they were different athletes, different uh, time periods. Things change, bodies change, uh, technology changes. I mean, the, the way they shoot the puck now with these new sticks, uh, you know, we use we use wood sticks and they weren't consistent. Uh, you know, you had your own pattern, but you know, one stick to the other was so different. You'd have one, you'd have a stick with a a three quarter inch heel on it one time, and then you'd go get another stick, and it was. Uh, it was a half inch, but the the uh, shaft was uh, stiff as a two by four. So, and now every stick is the same. And you know, all you have to do nowadays is lean on the stick, and the puck takes off. So, it, <laughs> it's it's hard to it's hard to compare. A good player yeah. in his own time was a good player. A good player now is a good player. You just you have to look at that in the in the context of the the the, the decade, I guess they played. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, maybe we could end on, I don't know if you have any stories that just kind of come to mind, but a memorable story, a funny story, you know, something from your career, if you have one that comes in, comes to well, mind. Well, one I like to talk about all the time is uh, I, I mentioned to you, um, uh, when I got sent to the minors, my first year, I played in Utica, uh, New York, the Mohawk Valley Comets of the North American Hockey League. And that was the league they, they based the, uh, the movie Slapshot on, and they actually use a lot of players uh, from my team in the movie as, as extras. So there's <laughs> about five guys that I played with in Utica that were my, were uh, in the movie. So I could sit there, watch the movie, and recognize the guys as the players that played against Paul Newman and those guys. <laughs> but the, the funny story was uh, they actually used our bus in the movie. The, the bus I had... The year I played in Utica was a bus they used. Really? And I don't know if you remember the story, but if you ever watched the movie, yeah. uh, they take an axe to the, the bottom of the bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so our our team, this was a year before I got there. They they um, they let the, they um, they paid Utica the Mohawk Valley Commons to use the bus, right? So they took the. They took the axe to the bus, broke the door in the movie, and paid, gave money to the owner of our team to fix the bus. Well, the owner pocketed the money, and basically our bus had a piece of plywood where the door was. <laughs> and our, our league, we played, we had 12-hour bus rides to go to teams. You know, we went from uh, Utica, New York, up to Bowes, 
Quebec. I still don't know where Bose Quebec is, but it was a 12, 14 hour bus ride. Maine was a 12, 14 hour bus ride. And what we did is we'd practice in, uh, in Utica, get our, our equipment sweaty, throw it in the bottom of the bus, jump in the bus, drive 12 hours in the middle of winter with the cold freezing air blowing through the, the plywood, we get off the off the bus, just go right to the go right to the game to play, and our, our equipment would be frozen solid because there was no heat in the bottom of the bus because there was plywood there. So that's one of the stories I could tell. And uh, we would get on the bus. It's there would be guys getting on the bus at seven in the morning. I think they came from the bar at five in the morning because these were guys that had no, no chance of making the NHL. They were just playing out their contracts. They'd get on the bus at seven in the morning, jump in their bunk because our bus had bunks, sleep off the, uh, the night before, get off the bus at six o'clock, get dressed and play the game. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is there's a lot of truth. To the movie oh yeah, Slash oh yeah. Shot. That movie was it was exaggerated. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, but it was we, based it, on some. Oh yeah, it was based on a lot of truths. That's a, I love that movie. It's a hilarious yeah. movie. It's yeah, a hockey classic. Yeah, and I actually, you know, so Paul Newman when they had you know they had scenes of the movie where Paul Newman was sitting in the bus, and we had where he was sitting, I was sitting there playing playing hearts for uh, for eight hours at a time, going to the game, and then we'd jump on the bus at, at 11 o'clock at night after the game, uh, get hang the beers out the window of the bus, and I we'd play hearts until 7 in the morning <laughs> and when we got off the bus and uh, play the next game uh, you know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock that night. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit different than playing in the NHL. <laughs> oh no, yeah, shoot, they have they have food in the locker room after the game. Then they have food on the plane for when you take the charter home, and then they yeah. have breakfast in the morning in the in the uh, locker room. Yeah, it's a lot different. <laughs> and let's not even go into the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get. Many... I don't want to get depressed. Yeah, many, many ways it's different. Many ways the game has changed. Yeah, we talked about the way the game has changed and the coaching and the speed and the skill, but it's yeah. also changed in the business side of it and the, oh, yeah. the money and uh, just all of it. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Well, they didn't know how to make a buck back then in the NHL. They didn't allow advertising on the boards because it was too European. No advertising on the ice. Uh you couldn't buy a jersey. You couldn't buy merchandise. And on top of that, our uh, our players rep uh, was one that took advantage of us because he was in cahoots with uh, with the owners. That was uh, the uh, what's his, uh, I can't think of his name right now. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, mm -mm. Anyway, the, yeah, he was. Uh, that was a whole other story. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Eagleson. Al, Alan Eagleson was a guy who was our representative and he basically screwed us over because he was in bed with the owners. Hmm. Yeah. Read, <laughs> look, that, look that up sometime, Alex. I will. Yeah. The, the will. Book is, somebody put a book out at net worth or network. And uh, that talks about the story, how he, he uh, took advantage of us and really took advantage of Bobby Orr because he was Bobby Orr's agent. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely have to look into that and yeah read about it yeah it's, yeah the, it's sad interesting but sad yeah there's um you know instances like that throughout sports or, or different things or people take advantage of their athletes as, as agents and you know it's yeah. stuff you, you don't want to see yeah. um but yeah I, the game obviously teams learned how to market yeah and i'm i you know i don't know if when it initially initially started but i had um jim thompson on a little while back um and he talked about when he was in anaheim and there was their first year and how uh -huh. since disney owned them you know there was all marketing all yep. you know putting that duck's name out there because disney was a business you know they ran right. they, they they knew how to market yeah and that was their movie the mighty ducks was their right movie. So, yeah 
so they could they could market it easier. So I don't know if you know in the nineties there is when things kind of started to. Yeah, that's change. that's kind of when it changed. Uh, you know, like I said, when the Olympic team won, uh, the college kids won the Olympics. Uh, people got excited about that, started to understand the game more, and then as it got into the southern climates, the southern uh, United States, uh, more and more fans, uh, more and more teams when i started in the nhl there were 21 teams you know how many teams are there now and you know and they're all over the united states and i think what happened too is more of the better athletes in the u.s started playing hockey yeah you know uh you know the the better best players in st louis let's say would be play play baseball or football or basketball whereas as as the sport grew uh more of the better athletes uh, gravitated towards hockey there were better coaches in the U.S. because a lot of the guys that went to college or played pro hockey in the U.S. stayed and helped develop the game. And uh, and then kids, I think, kind of got bored with baseball. You know, hockey's an exciting sport compared yeah. to play baseball, I think. And I'm nothing against <laughs> baseball, but, you know, when I, yeah. when I played baseball, I wanted to be a pitcher or a catcher. I didn't want to play in the outfield. And kids, <laughs> you know, kids grow up playing Nintendo and – and watching, you know, Sesame Street, and uh, and uh, you know, they want stimulation. And yeah, youth hockey is mo- a lot more stimulating than youth uh, youth baseball, youth soccer. Yeah, you, I think. you got those kids, you know, picking dandelions in the outfield, oh, yeah. know, looking for worms, or <laughs> yeah. So more and more kids gravitated. So you know, that's how you get. Well, Austin Matthews uh, is a perfect case. You know, he's a, there's a kid out of Phoenix or Arizona who watched the uh, Arizona Coyotes. And instead of wanting to play baseball, he wanted to play hockey. Yeah. And now, now he's a superstar in the NHL. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had guests on l- little lower levels, you know, different Division One or Division Three hockey players who have, were recruited out of California or different oh, yeah. warm climate states. I know Tech um, – has had kids from California, kids from Florida over recent years. I mean, that's a huge recruiting yeah. hotspot now. Yeah, and one thing that happened um, where it started with California, I mean, the L.A. LA uh, Kings were there for a long time, and the, Might- the Mighty Ducks came in, and then uh, now they have Anaheim and uh, who else? I can't even think of it. But the Sharks. What, and- yeah, the Sharks, exactly. Well, what happened, too, is uh, uh, roller hockey started to get very popular in the U.S., and it, it really, St. Louis was a, a hot, hot spot for roller hockey, and California was a huge hot spot. So kids gravitated from roller hockey into ice hockey, and that roller hockey really helped uh, develop uh, uh, ice hockey. Yeah, and it's really it's crazy everywhere. how the how the game grew from the beginning to where it's at now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a, a good place to wrap it up. Talked about a lot of things. You shared a lot of insight. Thank you, you know, for taking some time out of your evening to join me. Oh, anytime. Anytime I can help uh, uh, Michigan Tech or hockey or talk <laughs> about the old days. Yeah. Awesome. 